right. Thank you so much, Karan, for doing this interview with me. I would love to start with you just giving a really simple introduction of yourself and, and let my audience know just exactly who you are. Sure. Yeah. It's a, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Um, I love any opportunity to talk nerd science, gut health, <laughs> microbiome with anybody. So, uh, and I know you're one of the finest nerds in this field. So uh, <laughs> I'm excited to do that. Um, so a little background about me. I'm uh, trained as a research microbiologist. Um, I started my career in university um, and on a, on a research track at the university, really actually working on, on viruses and pathogenic viruses. Mm -hmm. Um, my focus was on HIV at the time, um, and this was in the early 2000s. Um, then I decided to leave university research because I really wanted to get more into human clinical trials and um, you know things that are more directly impactful that I could I could see and witness on a more regular basis. And so I started a clinical research organization here in Chicago where I started designing, running. Um, clinical trials for nutritional companies and dietary supplement companies in, in many different ways. And um, did that for a number of years until I got into the food safety microbiology as a microbiologist. I worked in the food industry itself, trying to safeguard foods from all of these amazing pathogens that are out there that we kind of select for with all of our cleaning procedures and the harsh chemicals that we use, right? We, we really concentrate and select for the worst of the worst foodborne pathogens. Um, so part of my, my world was about how do we bring about more of the friendly microbes into the space, into our food production spaces, so that we're not always concerned with the most harsh chemicals or trying to fight off and ward off these, these pathogens that, that tend to harm people every single year. Um, and you know, really out of a need, uh, myself and my business partner, Tom Bain, we founded Microbiome Labs because um, my research group was was hired by a large multinational company to study probiotics mm -hmm. and really give them a recommendation of what I think the next generation of probiotics would be. And when we did our studies, we basically came to find that the vast majority of what's out there really isn't doing anything. You know, there's, there's no scientific rationale behind how things are formulated. We came back to them and said, okay, here's our findings. We think all of this stuff here is kind of nonsense. And here's the approach you should take. And they said, thank you for your awesome work, but we just got acquired by somebody else. So we're not going to use any of this. So, um, so you know, fortunately that happened. And, and uh, Tom and I said, you know what, let's, let's create our own brand, our own company, and let's put together products that are really going to move the needle on people's health and wellness and really use the power of the microbiome to afford change in people's yeah. outcomes, right? So, yeah. so that's where Microbiome Labs came from. That's amazing. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. I, I remember my first introduction, you know, if you don't mind me sharing, to soil-based organisms because mm -hmm. this was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I had, was, uh, had been freshly hospitalized for ulcerative colitis, very, very ill, um, you know, even intravenous hundred milligrams of steroids wasn't helping that wanted to take out my colon, that kind of thing. And at that time you didn't exist. Microbiome labs didn't exist. And what did exist was, um, primal defense by garden mm -hmm. of life. And they, I think were kind of the first and foremost, at least in this sort of era for yep. soil based organisms. And I started taking that product three days after I was hospitalized coming out of hospitalization. And within a week, week and a half, I literally, I, I was down to like, you know, literally 90 pounds. Mm -hmm. And within a week and a half of taking their so based organism pro probiotic, I, you know, the circles under my eyes went away. I was digesting food. I had already gained like within a week and a half or something, probably seven or eight pounds. Mm -hmm. My spirits were lifting a little bit and I was getting hope. You know, yeah. um, I, I was starting to digest food and then that trend just continued over the weeks as I took them. Now, you know, um, fast forward years later, um, Garden of Life sold, you know, their yep. company to Nestle. The product is, is no longer what it once was, sad, sad to say. Um, thank goodness, you know, I found Microbiome Labs um, probably about four years ago. I found Megasporbiotic after years of... Um, needing and a, a, a severe need for quality, um, you know, soil-based organism probiotic and um, searching high and low 
and I found you guys and, mm -hmm. and you were born and it was just the perfect, <laughs> you know, sync. But I was wondering if, it, you know, I, I've heard so much of your, of, of your speaking. Um, I, my audience would love to know, as, as would I, your um, story of how, of, of the history of soil-based mm -hmm. organizing. I know a little bit, I'm sure yeah. you know more from your position, just the history of soil-based organisms. I specifically have been really fascinated with the history of, you know, HU of Bacill Bacillus mm -hmm. subtilis, because that really, truly, I think at the end of the day, ended up being the one that really, I mean, they all yeah. did, right? But transformation, you know, yep. and continues to be for my IBD community. So I was wondering if you could just elaborate a little bit on the history of them and how they mm -hmm. came about in the States and what they are in the States versus other countries, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and here's, here's where your story comes full circle. You know, I mentioned when I was talking about the, the foundations of, of microbiome labs that we work, we were hired by a large multinational company to research probiotics, right? That company was Garden of Life. And oh, I didn't were, know that. Yeah, and <laughs> we were working that. on, we All were working on- I didn't know that, okay. Totally. That makes yeah, sense. And, and, and we were working on the next iteration of, of primal defense. Okay. That was our job, right? We, because what, at that time, the founder of, um, of Garden of Life originally, Jordan, yeah. um, what he realized is that they had one spore-based bacteria in the formula and it was Bacillus subtilis, right? Yeah. And then they had all a bunch of this other stuff that- yeah they didn't well characterize the other things. Yes. And so what he was really looking for was how can we make a more spore focused product? Because he realized that the, the subtilis was what helped him. Because you know he founded the company based on his journey with, I think yes. it's the Thrones of Colitis. Similar right? to mine, runs very parallel to mine. Yeah. Totally. And, and what, what he took before Garden of Life existed was just Bacillus subtilis. Yeah. Very high doses of it that came from the lab of Dr. Simon Cutting at Royal Holloway at London University. So he put that as an ingredient in the, in the full formula, but the idea was to create an all spore based formula that we were working on. And so we actually created the mega spore formula for them. And, and then they got, as you know, as you mentioned, they got acquired and then that became something that they didn't choose to do. And we said, well, this is too important, powerful not to let it happen. So we did it ourselves, right? Yeah. So, Looking back, we're very grateful that that's how things turned out. Um, yeah. But 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 yeah, it's it's crazy. It's a full circle um, back back to your your story. Um, so to give you a little history of, of spores, so let's delineate the different categories of probiotics. Uh, we've got the lactic acid bacteria. That's the typical lactobacillus that people are familiar with. Yeah. I'll mention a little bit where those came from, how that ended up in probiotics. We've got bifidobacteria as well. So that's another category. Those aren't lactic acid bacteria, but they're also part of the probiotic story. Yeah. And then we've got soil and spore, right? And there's some delineation we have to do in between those two. So quick history on the lactic acid bacteria part. The lactic acid bacteria were typically used as fermentive bacteria, especially lactobacillus acidophilus. And what was good about acidophilus for fermentation was it could do the fermentation at a lower pH which means it created less of the sourness feeling yeah. when you ferment a dairy with it, right? So it became a great dairy fermenting bacteria. And what was realized in the 1930s, 40s, and so on, was that there was all of these digestive health benefits from fermented products. And so the iteration of going from consuming the, the, the fermented product to isolating the fermentive organism as a probiotic that happened sometime in the late 60s mm -hmm. when the term probiotic was coined yeah. by uh, these two researchers, Lily and Stilwell. So what industry started doing is going, okay, we can ferment this dairy and give you this wonderfully fermented dairy that can yeah. have health benefits, but we could also isolate the bacteria and give you just the bacteria itself, right? The leap there was that that bacteria is designed by nature to do fermentation in an outside environment and it's nothing like it can do in the gut. It can't function in the gut the same way, right? So lactobacillus started becoming the story around probiotics because of that jump from fermentation to now being a probiotic. Bifidobacteria became important because um, when, when they were starting to analyze people's stool to try to figure out what's growing in your gut, they were predominantly finding bifidobacteria, right? And the reason for that is 
the vast majority of bacteria in your gut cannot be plated out, cannot be grown on a plate like classical microbiology because most of the bacteria in your gut are anaerobic. So mm -hmm. oxygen is actually toxic to it, yeah. right? So all of these years before genetic analysis existed, microbiologists were taking poop samples and growing it out in plates and they were only finding a small handful of, of bacteria. Yeah. So then bifidobacteria became some of them because bifidobacteria con concentrations are also high in stool. So then they started to understand, okay, bifidobacteria may be important. Let's isolate some of these and turn them into probiotics and give them back to people, right? So that's where lacto and bifido came in. Now, soil-based organisms, the idea there was that engaging in the environment, there was more and more data showing that the closer you live to the environment, people in rural areas versus urban areas, people in rural areas tend to have more robust microbiomes. And the idea is like, okay, soil and engagement with soil is important for your health. We all know that now as well, right? So let's just grab a bunch of bacteria from the soil and then give it to you as a probiotic so that you can experience that benefit from the soil. However, there's a limitation there in, in two ways. One is it's hard to characterize all of those bacteria to really understand what they're doing. That was one of the problems that primal defense had, right? They had something yeah. like 33 different strains in there yeah. and they didn't really know most of what most of those strains did, right? Yeah. Um, so, so that's a limitation because then you don't know over time, like, is it causing a problem? Mm -hmm. Is it safe? You know, that all those questions come to mind. Also, the vast majority of bacteria in, in the soil don't actually survive through the gastric system, right? Our gastric system is designed to kill off most bacteria that we end up swallowing yes. inadvertently. So many of them, although they may be able to stimulate the immune system to a certain degree, aren't going in, colonizing and actually doing anything. Exactly. Like that, yeah. Right. So within the soil category, there are the spore formers. Mm -hmm. Those are a specialized version of the soil bacteria that have this ability to put this armor-like coating around themselves so they can survive through the gastric system. And as it turns out, spore formers have very specialized functions in our gut. They protect our gut in many ways. The history of the first spore-based product that came out as a probiotic is actually really quite interesting. Mm. Um, it was founded in Germany, right? So uh, yes. when the, right, yeah. did you, I don't know if you've heard that story, but yeah, right. And they so were the prescription there for a long time in like hospital settings. And, mm -hmm. and they still are. And they, they still, still are. are That's today. my understanding. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They still are. So fascinating. Totally. And, and, and yeah. here's how it was discovered, right? So um, in during World War II, the German army, when, when during their campaigns in North Africa, um, lots of German soldiers were dying of dysentery from yeah. the water and all that, right? What they realized was that the locals, when the locals would get sick and, and get dysentery-like symptoms, what the locals did to treat it was to actually find and eat dried camel dung, right? So they would find pieces of dried camel dung and they would actually eat it as a therapeutic and it would yeah. alleviate the dysentery, right? right. Um, so, so, they, so the German scientists took a bunch of the dried camel dung back and to try to isolate what is the agent in the dry yeah. camel dunk that's actually helping. Yeah. And they discovered Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus quasi um, in the in the dried camel dung. And so then they isolated the organism and they launched it as a prescription probiotic called Enterogermina back in 1952. Wow. And that is that drug is still on the market today, very widely used in Europe. Latin America, parts of Southeast Asia yeah. as a way of treating gut yeah. infections, right? Yeah. It's a probiotic spore. Yeah. Um, so in two thirds of the world, these spore-based probiotics are used as prescription drugs to yes. treat gut infections, upper respiratory tract infections, immune disorders, all kinds of things. In the US, uh, we of course have it as a dietary supplement. Yeah. Maybe it should be prescription. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, you know. Help the efficacy that. is there. Yeah, exactly. It, you know, it just reminded me when you were talking about the camel, um, you know, my, my graduate degree is in Chinese medicine and mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the herbs in their, comp, their pharmacies, Chinese pharmacy is a uh, flying squirrel feces. Wow. It just dawned on me just now. I just, because all these years I'm like, how in the world did they discover that that was actually medicinal? Yeah. Who knows how they found that, you know, camel dung was, I don't know, but who was the first one to 
to, to try it, right? You guys don't guy, know how these things come about. Yeah, imagine he was so sick. He was like, I'm just gonna eat dung. I don't care. Desperation is my only guess. But um, <laughs> totally. yeah, it makes me really truly wonder now, all these years, if flying squirrel feces, if they were kind of, because this was 2,000 years ago, this 2,000 mm -hmm. years ago, it Crazy. makes me wonder if that's sort of the direction they were going with it. Who knows? Yeah. Um, well, and you know, even in India, I grew up in India until I was about uh, 13 years old and a cow dung is very therapeutic in many ways, right? So yeah. they would actually apply cow dung to wounds and uh, to, to skin issues wow. and so on. Um, and it's known to be extremely therapeutic. Um, and there's all of these biological activities, including yeah. loads and loads of spores in the cow dung. Right. Wow. That's fascinating. I, yeah. I don't even know what to say. <laughs> really to all that well, well here's the thing good thing you don't have to eat dried camel dung anymore well we thank can, goodness you can put it all in a in a nice neat capsule for you although i've done fecal transplant therapy so i will <laughs> say i would have been especially when i was very ill 10 years i would have done it i'm one yeah. of those girls you would have done happy. anything at that point right? yeah mm -hmm. they were trying to take my colon out you know so yeah. you do anything at that point you know um you know it's, Thank you for that that history and explanation. Um, that was more than I knew, which I, I know my audience will appreciate. Um, you know, something that I tackle on a daily basis with, you know, I get emails every day, as I'm sure, you know, you do, um, with people just really suffering, mm -hmm. um, whether it's, you know, IBS or candida or SIBO or Crohn's or colitis, all these things. And, you know, explaining to them why and how soil-based story, and I know you've answered this question a million times mm -hmm. and it's so redundant, but it's so important because when I, when these people reach out to me, they're really, it's, it's an elementary question as far as these things go, but it's such an important question to announce and spread is that why are these so different, which you touched mm -hmm. on a little bit in your, in our, in your, in what you just said, but you can really highlight and emphasize, you know, the acidity of the stomach all those things, how, you know, I'm, I'm constantly trying to communicate and yeah. reinforce, how are these different and why are these different? Because, you know, I had a practice for about um, a decade um, before, you know, pre my, my collaboration with microbiome labs. And I was just, um, you know, constantly trying to um, prescribe and suggest probiotics. Mm -hmm. And because I couldn't find the soil ones anymore, it didn't like Garden of Life. So you hadn't got, anyway, I was just struggling, searching, and the traditional regular probiotics, they weren't helping me. Right. And they certainly weren't helping my patients, even though I wanted them to so much, you know? Right. Yeah. And I just, I was, I would just be so disheartened every week they'd come in and and I'd be have them on the best of the best traditional you know probiotics that you could possibly find on the market and nothing yeah. no progress and myself and if anything often it, it made me worse and made right. my clinically I saw them make patients worse not all the time but often yeah. Can you just highlight a few of the reasons why these are just so different yeah and that's a, that's a really critical point so um, I think for your for your audience to really understand and appreciate it, we have to let's let's talk a little bit about the physiology that's happening inside the gut when they're experiencing things like IBS or SIBO or Crohn's colitis and so on. Um, you know what's what's really happened is is a significant dysbiosis that's yes. occurred, right? So now they have this measurable imbalance in the population of microbes in their system. They they've got more microbes that are uh, that are opportunistic pathogenic type of organisms producing toxins, driving inflammation, not producing the critical compounds that are required in order to repair, rebuild the lining of the gut, modulate the immune response and so on. Uh, one of the things that's critically important for people to understand is maintenance of the structure and function of your digestive tract is dependent on microbes, right? There's lots of stuff that we cannot do for ourselves that we outsource to the microbes that live in the system in order to maintain the system appropriately. Mm -hmm. So as soon as those microbes are off balance, then the, then the repair microbes, the maintenance microbes, all of the ones that keep the system functioning the way they should, they're no longer able to do their job yeah. because now you've got an overabundance of microbes that are trying to break down the system. Yeah. Right. So that that shift is really where everything starts to go wrong. And all of these conditions, right, we might describe SIBO, 
IBS, IBD, different, with different tags and all that. But when you look at the underlying dysfunction, it's very similar among all of them, yes. right? Yeah. It's that leakiness in the gut, the right. breakdown of the barrier structure, breakdown of the mucosa, the, the overgrowth of pathogens and uh, opportunistic organisms and so on. Yeah. So that yeah. structure exists across the board. Sure. Um, so then the question becomes, well, why is it that the spores um, and the spore-based probiotics that, that are found in the soil organ, uh, products, why do they have a special function there? So at the end of the day, what it seems like is that we have outsourced a certain degree of protective and repair mechanism to these organisms, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think of the course of human evolution, we have been consuming these bacteria inadvertently for millions of years. Forever. Right? Yeah. Forever. Yeah. So uh, per mother nature, humans have always eaten dirt. They've always drank waters out of rivers and streams. Yeah. Little human babies were always born and put in the ground and they put everything in their mouth right. around them, right? Yeah. Um, we've always lived in close-knit communities and, and, um, and um, you know, villages and so on. So we had a lot of human interaction. So mother nature could not foresee that, you know, after two, three million years of evolution, all of a sudden we'll get to this point where we've barred ourselves from nature yeah. in these concrete jungles and no longer gain exposure to these organisms. So we are wholly inadequate in our capability of repairing, maintaining, and fixing our gut, yeah. right? We only have, as a, as a very sophisticated organism, we only have 22,000 functional genes in our chromosome. Now that sounds like a lot, but then when you think about an earthworm has somewhere around 38,000 wow. functional genes, right? <laughs> a rice plant has close to 40,000 functional genes. And here we are, almost half of the genetic capability of a plant that makes rice, right? So how are yeah. we so sophisticated, right. right? How are we doing this with each other on Zoom and this amazing technology and all that? Well, we have three and a half million microbial genes in our system, mm. right? 150 times more microbial DNA in our system than human DNA. So the vast majority of our capabilities comes from microbial DNA and microbial performance and function. And so we classically as a species have done a great job through the course of evolution to incorporate microbes into our system and then give them all jobs, right? Mm -hmm. So the human is actually called a holobiome, which is a super organism, mm -hmm. right? We are a walking, talking rainforest. We are a, a construct made up of hundreds and hundreds of different species that have to work together to perpetuate the health of the whole. Mm -hmm. At any given time, you could pull out a liter of your blood and 50% of the molecules in your blood come purely from bacteria right? Wow. Not from our own synthesis, not from digesting food and pulling it out of food, comes from just bacteria who sit in your gut and make compounds for you. So that part is really important for people to understand that we don't have a mechanism to maintain homeostasis and balance in our gut. We don't have a mechanism to, make, to repair the lining of our gut. We don't have a mechanism to modulate inflammation properly in our gut. So if our microbes aren't there to do it for us, we are going to go down this line of having severe gut dysfunction that starts with IBS, that starts with bloating, yeah. but it can end up in places like colorectal cancer, right? Yeah. So that's the premise we're living with here. And that's why these problems are so prevalent yeah. because everything around us hurts our microbes, right? We are a microbial construct. We're supposed yeah. to be this walking, talking rainforest, yeah. but everything around us is antimicrobial, right? The water we drink, the foods we eat, the paint we put on our walls, the off-gassing from our carpets, the our hand personal sanitizer. care products, totally the non-stop sanitizing now, yeah. you know, all of that stuff yeah. is driving dis yeah. disruption to our ecosystem. And the moment those maintenance repair microbes are lower, then the microbes that are opportunistic and toxigenic, yeah. then our system starts to break down and cannot repair itself, right? So what the, what the spores do is they have a mechanism specifically embedded in their genetics to come into our system. They use something called quorum sensing where they come in and they read all the other bacterial signatures, right? And then based on reading the bacterial signatures, they can identify microbes that are overgrown 
and problematic and microbes that are underrepresented and are needed. And they will go and sit next to the overgrown problematic microbes and actually bring down their levels. They will compete with them. They'll produce compounds to bring down their levels. They do all kinds of tricks to bring down the problematic organisms. And at the same time, they will produce compounds to support the growth of the really important fixing bacteria, maintenance bacteria, right? So they shift the balance within your microbiome and they do it at a level of intelligence that we don't understand about our own. I was just, they're basically genius. I mean, in a Absolutely. nutshell, they're, we don't even comprehend their we level don't. of, yeah. I mean, if you gave me a hundred billion dollars and the hundred best microbiologists in the world, we couldn't engineer a microbe that knows all of this, right? This is a, 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 um, a factor of two to three million years of evolutionary perfection, yeah. you know? And, it's, and there's a process, it's called symbiogenesis. Mm -hmm. Symbiogenesis is the forced mutualism between different species because of close proximity to each other, right? So mm -hmm. we've been eating these microorganisms all of these years, all of these millions of years. We ended up working out a deal with them where we said, okay, guys, we're going to give you a home. This is now your home. Mm -hmm. Our immune system recognizes you as self. Our immune system doesn't attack you when, when you come in. And so you, this is now your home, but we need you to maintain the home. We need you to do the housekeeping work, mm -hmm. right? Now, this speaks to why some of the conventional approach to probiotics actually can make people worse, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and now the studies to show this, we've been talking about this from a hypothetical standpoint since uh, 20, 2012, 2013, where when you take a pro probiotic product, let's take your conventional probiotic, let's say it has 15 strains of various lactobacilli and let's say 50 billion CFUs, yeah. right? The problem with that is that's a very unnatural way to encounter those microbes, mm -hmm. right? When you're born, you get your set of lactobacilli from your mom in close interaction with dad. And for the rest of your life, that becomes your own unique set of lactobacilli. Nowhere else do you encounter 50, 100, 200 billion CFUs every day of 15, 20 different strains of lactobacilli. Right. That's an unusual yes. exposure to the it's system. It's very artificial. It's very artificial, it's very right? Artificial. It doesn't happen yeah. in nature. And so what happens then is if you already have a freaking out overactive immune system because your immune system is constantly trying to yeah. battle these pathogens yeah. and opportunistic bacteria, yeah. right, that are in your lining of your gut, and then you throw in 50 billion of a bunch of bacteria that the immune system doesn't recognize as self, it's going to trigger more inflammatory exactly. immune response. Yeah. Right? Not, not to mention the histamine overload mm -hmm. that, that they cause in a lot of histamine sensitive patients or patients with mast cell activation syndrome, all that stuff. I mean, that's a whole nother, but closely related, right? I mean, totally. Yeah. That's absolutely right. And, yeah. um, and then there was a, there was a study that published in 2019 from the, from the Israeli Academy showing that when you take like a 50 billion dose of multiple lactobacilli, what they actually will do is they'll actually compete with your native lactobacilli for binding sites and can actually slow down your recovery. They did this as a post-antibiotic um, therapy. So they, you know, it, they expose the microbiome to antibiotics. That means a lot of your own natural bacteria will die off. And mm -hmm. then they added in this probiotic. And what they showed was it actually slowed down the recovery of your natural bacteria wow. because these probiotic bacteria yeah. that are essentially foreign to your gut are now competing with your natural bacteria, you know? And so it's so the dosing and all that, like going 100 billion, 200 billion, yeah. 300 billion, it's all kind of nonsensical, it makes no sense. Yeah, it, and it, I've called it a scam many yeah. times, unfortunately. It um, it's it's a it's, marketing way of doing product is. formulation, it's, right? And it's purely marketing, it's purely yeah. numbers. Yeah, it's very totally. unfortunate. And um, it makes me very angry at times, mm -hmm. um, which kind of leads me to my next question. And thank you so much for that explanation of how they right. differ. Um, but, you know, I've, I've even written blogs about that and this particular subject of, of um, you know, these cookie cutter diagnoses that mm -hmm. many doctors, you know, subscribe to. Um, Crohn's and colitis being one of them, in my opinion, um, IBS, of course, being the sort of umbrella catch-all, right? right, right. Um, you know, how, how do you feel about these, these cookie cutter diagnoses? Do you feel that they have their place and they're useful? Do you feel like 
you know, gosh, we have we have so far to go with these labels. Yeah. Tell me about how you feel about those. So so it drives me crazy because <laughs> and I tell you, you why, <laughs> right? Because the problem with giving the diagnosis a name is then there is this compartmentalized treatment regimen for that name yes. diagnosis, yeah. right? Whereas, and, and then especially when you throw like a crazy umbrella name like IBS, yeah, it's like, I don't know what's going on. It seems yeah. like your bowels are irritated, <laughs> yeah. so, you know? Right, yeah. Yeah, it's a fancy <laughs> diagnosis as my medical professional tells me is your irritated bowel, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's like telling somebody who's suffering from like bad anxiety and all that, you've got sadness syndrome, you know? And like, <laughs> right. yes. So, and yeah. and yeah, so exactly. just, it's so um, not helpful, you it's know? Not. Yeah. It's not, it's not because then it becomes, then it goes into the conventional approach of medicine. It's like, okay, we have a name now for it. We have a diagnosis. Because there's a name, there's got to be a pill for this name, right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it conflates the issue around what yeah. is actually driving the symptomology. Yeah. And, and when you really dig into the research, what you find is that all of these conditions are the same condition, but a different spectrum. Fundamentally. Totally. Yeah. thread, same thing. Same yeah. exact thing, yeah. same pathophysiology, yeah. same root cause. And then depending on other uh, extraneous factors, like maybe your, your, your lifestyle, your history, your genetics, it expresses in different ways. Like SIBO yeah. is one of those that drives me crazy, right? It, it's now labeled as small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah. And I have been doing lectures over the last three years showing how SIBO should not be a condition of its own. It's actually a symptom of a much bigger problem that's right. going on in the person's system, right? And the problem with naming it SIBO is the focus now has become all about the overgrowth and yeah. how do you bring down the overgrowth, right? So kill, 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 kind of, right? Exactly. Antimicrobial yeah. after antimicrobial, kill, kill, yep. kill. Yeah. Or antibiotic and antibiotic, you know, yeah. multiple right. rounds of it. Uh, and then of course, because that's not really the root cause problem, it just grows right back, yes. right? It yes. just keeps coming yeah. back and coming back. So yeah, I, I think it's it's a, it's wholly damaging because it really misdirects treatment yeah. and it really avoids the issue of what is the real root cause here. Yes, yeah. You know, and 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 the root cause is simpler than we think, mm. right? We get into like colitis, for example, and then microcolitis and this and that, all these variations of it. At the end of the day, it's the same damn thing. It's yeah, driving right. the same condition. Yeah, yeah. And I'll give you an example. Um, you know, there was a, a friend of mine's uh, child, right? She was, I think, eight or nine years old, or 10 years old, somewhere around there. And she kept having this like really bad pains all the time in her gut. And, and you know, we were trying to describe to her, uh, describe to him like, yeah, she's got the same pathophysiology that at some point they're going to label as, as, as colitis, yeah. right? And, and they're like, well, but, but the GI scoped them and said it's not colitis. Well, the reason they're saying it's not colitis is because there isn't enough damage yet that they can visualize to grade yeah, it with colitis, wow. right? Mm -hmm. But it's getting there. Yeah. And I, and I kept saying, I'm telling you, they're going to diagnose it as colitis. Even though they're telling you now it's not, the way they diagnose it as colitis is they're looking for a certain degree of damage, right. but that damage is coming, yeah. you know? And so sure enough, you know, she's suffering, she's suffering. They're, they're not really doing much or giving her medication here and there. And then nine months later, another scope. Oh, by the way, you have colitis. Yeah. And it's like, right. told you, you know, yeah. it's not like they have some miracle way of figuring out what the problem is. They're just not addressing the root cause, right? And sure. so, sure. yeah, I, I'm with you on that. It, it really, it drives me crazy. And the thing is, <clears throat> people don't realize they have so much more control mm. over the outcomes of these issues yeah. than they think, right? Absolutely. Yeah, because, because when you put a fancy name on it, like ulcerative colitis or microcolitis or something like that, it sounds like, oh my God, something went wrong with my system. It's bad luck. And I got this condition and now, you know, I'm really hoping my doctors figure this out. Well, no, it's actually a very common dysfunction that yeah. in your case has gotten to this point, but there's a lot more you can do about it than you think. Sure. Yeah. It's, it makes me sad to be quite honest, you know, because I mean, I, 
you know, I got diagnosed with ulcerative colitis at 15, you know, so I was, I was, here I was, I was at a performing arts high school, shining in, in dance. I was a ballet and modern dancer. And all of a sudden I'm running to the bathroom constantly. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, I'm, I'm losing blood. I'm losing weight. Mm. I'm very sick. And, um, you know, it, it was just, it was, it's very tragic at the age of 15 to be mm -hmm. labeled, to be given a label at such mm -hmm. an age, because, you know, you're, you're, you're very um, impressionable at that yep. age. And even in your, you know, twenties, whatever, you know, and these, these labels end up sticking with you. And I feel like end up preventing, right. A lot of um, evolution in the yep. understanding of what's really going on. And I feel like sometimes that's the most tragic part of these labels. You know? Yeah, it, they they become your identity. Yes, right? exactly. You, you, yeah. you live the rest of your life as this condition. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And, it, and it does hinder you in progress in all other areas. Yeah. Um, you know, like, do you still dance? Do you still do it for fun? And Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, yeah. I, I actually became a hot yoga teacher, uh, you Ooh, know, about a decade right. ago. I kind of trans transferred all of my dance training into hot yoga as the years went on because I love it. you know ballet dancing is not easy on the body and so I had a lot of structural kind of you know issues and then of course all the years struggling um, with you know colitis my body needed a little bit more sort of therapeutic kind of movement yeah. so yeah. yeah so I got into dance well, that's awesome. I'm so glad you're, you you found an outlet for that because that's, yeah. that's important, right? Because, because uh, again, that kind of label can make people feel inadequate in so many ways, oh, my right? Goodness. And you, and you, it actually makes you mad at your body. Like, oh, why are you I doing can't... this to me? Right? Yeah. I, I can't even describe the years of the inadequacy and the frustration and disappointment and the, um, you know, all, all of that, all of the psychological stuff that comes along with a label. Not to mention, you know, I mean, I've heard you speak about and I'm aware of, <clears throat> you know, how these, you know, dysbiosis, of course, impacts, you know, serotonin and, mm -hmm. you know, all these and hormones and all these things that equate to um, just a healthy mental state, you know, yeah. and so um, when you have dysbiosis, certainly Crohn's and colitis, and of course that includes IBS and candida and SIBO and all those other conditions, um, mental health is a real issue. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, and and because your gut is messed up at that point, right? And and most of it is not even your fault. It's because of it's really what not. you've been drinking yeah. and you know the water you're exposed to and and things yeah. that you would have no idea would have that kind of impact on your system, yeah. especially at the age of 15, right? Yeah. You, you, you just took the antibiotics that your doctor gave you, not even knowing that it may have long-term impact and so on. Um, you know, and, and so then you, you, you get to a point where now your, your body's not functioning the way it should. Yeah. And that in itself is incredibly stressful and can be uh, anxiety inducing and depressing. Um, but because your gut is messed up, your brain gets messed up because of the gut, important gut brain connection yeah. and that actually puts you in a worse place to deal with the stress. Exactly. Right. And you're, you're exactly. wholly inadequate in dealing with the stress. A hundred percent. I'm so glad yeah. that you, you touched on that because it's a real issue with the audience that reaches out to me. They're just really struggling mentally and it's it's mm -hmm. really one and the same thing and trying to get them to understand that you know is crucial you know yeah depression and anxiety start in the gut yes they are these are gut conditions they're yes. symptoms of a gut condition yes um you know a great example of that is campylobacter infection you know which is the second most prevalent um uh, uh, you know foodborne illness uh, yeah. from, from chicken, yeah. um, the, the first response campylobacter infection is sudden onset of panic and anxiety, mm. you know? So here's a pathogen. Yeah. in your gut, yeah. you know, not necessarily giving you the same kind of diarrhea and vomiting and all that salmonella would it's giving, it's actually creating neurotransmitters that are going up to your brain and causing severe anxiety out of the blue. Wow. Right. I so it, that. it's interesting. You touched on that because, you know, I used to do stool tests all day long, comprehensive mm -hmm. stool tests with all of my patients. And I would just run one on myself just constantly. And the two that just kept showing up again and again and again 
almost with just complete consistency it was campylobacter and mm -hmm. klebsiella pneumonia mm -hmm. yep you know, and these two oh, yeah, yeah. specifically i'm sorry with ibd patients with crohn's and colitis patients but just again and again and again mm -hmm. so it's really interesting that you mentioned that and of course of course my it's just a given in my world that my crohn's and colitis people are dealing with anxiety mm -hmm. specifically Absolutely. and depression is the opposite side of the same coin you know so um, it's, it's, I really try to impress to them that it, there's such a, a correlation yeah. um, with that. And, you know, and, and, and once we put them on, you know, sort of based probiotics, things really do start to improve mind, yeah. body, one in the same. And totally. it's such an amazing thing to witness, you know, my personally and yeah. professionally, and I'm sure you've witnessed it again and again and again, which fuels yeah. your mission i'm sure entirely but wow you know i just still am in awe of it you know yeah and and here's the thing we were just smart enough to realize that nature has already provided the tools yeah. right we just have yeah. to be smart enough to find them and, and study them to know that they do what they do and then give them to people right right this is not a microbe that we did any special engineering on and yeah. so on these are bacteria that we just had to recognize was what nature had put out here right. through the course of evolution to help us kind of work and modulate and repair the issues that are going on in the gut. And when you start repairing that, you start actually changing lots of other yeah. things physiologically. Yeah. I'll give you an example. In our first uh, leaky gut study that we published, you know, we were looking at leaky gut and inflammation associated with leaky gut. And of course, we saw with the megaspore that we were able to significantly help leaky gut in as little as 30 days without any other changes. Uh, and that dramatically changed inflammatory pathways and so yeah. on as well. But one of the things that I, that we observed in there that was reached statistical significance, which means for your audience that it, the data was very relevant and, mm. and was actually quite meaningful, mm. um, was the gut brain connection data. So this was on uh, the hunger hormone ghrelin, right? Mm. So ghrelin resistance, meaning over time, people develop this resistance to leptin and ghrelin, which is the ghrelin, the hunger hormone, leptin is the satiety hormone. Mm -hmm. um, what tends to happen over time is with all of this release of ghrelin, um, we, we become more and more in tune to just overeating all the time, mm -hmm. right? We don't get that satiety signal. Yes. And our, it is our gut that is supposed to tell our brain that, that there's enough food coming in, so stop producing the hunger hormone. That signaling gets corrupted over time. So mm -hmm. what you see, what we saw is in the patients before they started the probiotic, they would come in fasted, right? So they'd be about eight, nine hours fasted. Mm -hmm. We measured their ghrelin levels, their hunger hormone levels. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, the hunger hormone levels are high because they came in fasted. Sure. Then we'd give them a 2000 calorie meal and their ghrelin hunger hormone levels would almost not drop at all, right? Their hunger hormone levels were still almost as high as when they were fasted. Wow. Despite having 2000 calories of input already in, right? So that, that gut brain connection was completely disrupted in these individuals with leaky gut and inflammation and so on. Then after 30 days of the probiotic, when we did the same challenge again, they would come in fasted, Ghrelin levels would be elevated, which is normal because you're hungry at that point. We'd give them the meal. And then right after the meal, ghrelin levels would drop 50%, mm. right? So now yeah. they're no longer hungry. Now we're seeing the reestablishment of the communication between the gut and the brain, where the gut is saying to the brain, hey, we got plenty of food, stop producing the hunger hormone, yeah. and then the brain stops, Wow. right? So it, it was absolutely fascinating, but we saw that kind of impact in just 30 days of taking the spores because we're repairing all of these systems that become corrupted one after the other once your gut starts becoming dysfunctional. Okay, I'm sure the vagus nerve and maybe connected related to that communication that starts to happen maybe. That's exactly right, yeah, because yeah. The, the communication happens between your gut lining, which is covered with something called the enteric nervous system, yeah. right? All of the nerve endings that, are, that, are, that line your gut. In fact, you've got more nerve endings in your gut than you do in your spinal cord. Right. It's a much more dense yeah. neurological system. It's only second to the brain. Yeah. And so then your gut, that all of that nerve bundle from your gut is connected di directly to your brain through the vagus yeah. nerve. But what happens when you have leaky gut is endotoxins or toxins that are produced in the gut mm -hmm. actually move up that vagus nerve 
and they it actually they actually lodge themselves in an area called the dorsal vagal complex, which is somewhere in your brain stem, and that blocks the signals between the gut and the brain. Yeah. Another effect of that blocking signals we meant we talk about the hunger hormone part of it, but the other effect of it is the bowel movement part of it itself because in order for the bowels to contract and move and, and allow you to defecate properly and to have normal bowel movements, those signals come from the brain. Mm -hmm. And when your gut is leaky and that channel is blocked, those mm -hmm. signals are getting lost. Right. And that's why lots of people face chronic constipation, poor bowel movement and so on, because again, that leakiness in the gut is blocking the signal. Right, and, I'm, and I know LPS comes into play too mm -hmm. in there with the constipation. Yep. Um, huge problem, right? And uh, and that was another question I was actually going to ask you is and you've talked a lot about LPS and mm -hmm. um, I have a basic understanding of it. Do you feel like, you know, for my Crohn's and colitis patients out there, as well as, you know, the IBS and all of these gut dysfunctions, LPS plays a huge role, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you want to just briefly summarize how it plays, what it is, yep. you know, and, and, and how it's really playing a role and then how Megaspore really comes in and, and resolves some of that. Yeah, so LPS stands for lipopolysaccharide. That's of course a big long word that nobody wants to say over and over again. So we say LPS, yeah. um, but it's a very potent toxin, right? It induces severe inflammatory responses in the body uh, and it's being produced in your microbiome all the time. The reason for that is about 60% of the bacteria that live in your gut, even your friendly bacteria, mm -hmm. make this LPS and, and the bacteria use it for various reasons, right? It's sitting in the cell membrane of the bacteria. It uses it for attachment and communicating yeah. with other bacteria and so on. So it's not abnormal that your bacteria would have it. Yeah. What is abnormal is when the bacteria dies, the LPS and bacteria are constantly dying and regenerating in your gut, right? So every time your bacteria dies, yeah. it releases this LPS into the gut environment. If your gut is leaky, the LPS is allowed to leak through the barrier and enter your circulation. Now, when LPS is in your circulation or in the inner lining of your gut, it causes massive inflammatory responses. And LPS is so pervasive, it can get into deep recesses of the brain like the amygdala and the hippocampus and uh, it, by, it interferes with serotonin binding and dopamine binding in the brain. It can cause inflammation in the, in the brain that drives beta plaquing in the brain. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. You can get in your joints and cause joint inflammation. It gets into your lungs. Right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. Gets in your neurons. Fibromyalgia to LPS. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Almost every, I mean, like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, fibromyalgia. Most autoimmune conditions, all these autoimmune, autoimmune conditions, yep. yeah. Uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes. The, the number one predictor of the development of type 2 diabetes is how much LPS you have in your blood. Wow. Right? That's number one. It's so profound. And, and so, once again, just sad to me that Western medicine doesn't recognize this because, absolutely. because and, it's so important. And those diabetes studies were published by the American Diabetic Association. Wow. You know, the, the number one diabetes association in, in conventional medicine, but conventional medicine doesn't have a solution for LPS, right? right. And, and it's constantly produced. It's called an endotoxin because it's a toxin that's created from within. So you yeah. can't escape it versus an exotoxin, that one that comes in from the outside, like a yeah. mold toxin, right? You yeah. might be able to move from your moldy home or something like that. Right. But in this case, it's always produced in the gut. And unless the lining of the gut is, has the right integrity to prevent LPS from migrating through, it's always going to migrate through. It's always going to set up inflammation. It's always going to cause tissue yeah. damage and drive disease, right. right? So when we first came out with the Megaspore, our big focus was, can we change the structure and function in the gut lining to prevent LPS from migrating across yeah. uh, constantly, yeah. right? right? And that was what our first study was all about was, showing that even in as little as 30 days, we can reduce the amount of LPS migrating through uh, into circulation by over 60%. And that's with just taking the probiotic and not doing anything else. That's right? incredible. So, I mean, obviously, you know, all these, so many companies selling antimicrobials for these gut infections, are you anti-antimicrobials? Yeah. Do you know, you I, I'm really not comfortable with how they're used right now. I think there's probably a time and a place where they could be beneficial and maybe for short durations. Sure. Um, but these long-term use constantly of antimicrobials 
you know, because uh, there's a misconception here that because they're natural antimicrobials, they're somehow safe or, or sure. fine, right? Sure. Uh, but they are, they kill bacteria just like an antibiotic would kill a bacteria. Yes. And, yes. and they don't specifically kill bad bacteria, right? They, they kill all bacteria. And so they can create yeah. real severe dysbiosis in people over time. Yeah. And so this whole idea, there, there was a simplistic, overly simplistic strategy that came up in functional medicine, which was um, like, yeah. you know, wipe out and then reseed, yeah. right? But we can't do that. That doesn't happen in the microbiome. It almost is more. It does, almost does more damage. Yep. Than good. Absolutely. More harm than good. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. because the microbiome is far more complex than that. And what are you going to reseed it with? How are you going to find three hundred different organisms to reseed the gut with? You know, with with ninety percent of them being anaerobic bacteria that you've never yeah. even heard of, right? Yeah. So this whole like wiping out and reseed, wiping out and reseed thing is just a weird, simplistic way of looking at it. Um, at the end of the day, what we really need to do is support yes. the present yeah. and, and beneficial microbes that are in the system and get their numbers back up. Yeah. Because when their numbers are up, they start to fix everything. Right. right. Yeah. It, you right. know, it, it almost, it, it just became a trend and a fad, just mm -hmm. like probiotics. It was the next thing to kill, kill, kill this yep. oregano oil. And, but, you know, and, um, you know, clinically, I've definitely seen that replenishing and restoring has gone so much further than mm -hmm. the kill, kill, kill method. I'm not like you not saying that an antimicrobial perhaps doesn't have a time and place in certain cases, but I have mm -hmm. seen again and again and again, it caused more damage than good as binders. Same thing, which Holy. I know you are not a huge fan of. Yep. Um, yeah, I think the restoring and the replenishing, it just goes so much further. Totally. You know, it's, 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 a, it's a complex ecosystem, and we know now some aspects of the ecosystem that need to be supported in order for the system to work better, and we know how to support it, yeah. right? We, so we have that information, yeah. and it's powerful. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the more we do that, the more we support the components of the ecosystem that are going to, to actually do the work in fixing the system, right. yeah. you know, the better outcomes we'll get without, without all the, you know. Yeah, it's, it's just so much more intrinsic and mm -hmm. organic and natural and yeah. Totally, you yeah. know, and just, just think about nature, think about ecosystems, right. how much success have we had in the natural world of just killing and wiping out stuff. Right. right. It just it doesn't work. Right. Not a whole lot. Uh, yeah. 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 You know, that that brings me to a, another question I had. You know, one of the ongoing, I guess, challenges I've faced as a practitioner, and I faced it personally, too, in the beginning of my journey with soil based organisms mm -hmm. is die off. And I know mm -hmm. you've talked a lot about that, but specifically with the, the, the community that reaches out to me are are typically very um, chronic cases, long-term mm -hmm. digestive disorders, Crohn's and colitis specifically being you know, debilitating and, and they do experience and I experience die off. And how would you, and I know you've spoken on this, but addressing this with these people is a real thing because it often just turns them off completely totally. and they wanna just throw it away and be done. And if I would have done that, I never would have gotten through my process. Yep. So I just backed way, way, way off almost licking my finger in the beginning, you know, right, how, yeah, so absolutely. How, how would you touch on and address the die off that people are experiencing with us? Yeah. So ultimately, because what, what's happening is an ecosystem change, right? Um, that change is going to be felt by certain people in the form of Herxheimer or die off yes, reactions. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, for the most part, it's a positive thing Yes. Uh, because then, you know, a change is happening, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you're kind of, you have to get through that healing crisis. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's basically the, 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 the worst of the worst bugs that are in there causing you problems. They're making their last ditch effort and they're trying to hang on. So they're going to release as much of their toxins as they can. They're going to fight and battle for yeah. their space. Yeah. And you're sending in something that's going to work against those microbes. And, uh, but temporarily it's going to be very uncomfortable yeah. and be uncomfortable. Sure. So we've come up with a number of, of techniques to help people get through it. Like you said, very small dosing going super slow. We've had people that it's taken them six months to get to a full capsule, yeah. right? Going like an eighth of a capsule every day or every and other day. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I really was. Yeah. But, but it's, you're on a path, right? Yeah. And, and what, what people should understand is that it took, 
20, 15, 30 years for your gut to get this messed up, it's going to take a little bit of time to start getting it back to shape, right? Yeah. And, and if you have to put in the six months to get yourself up to the clinical dose, put it in because if you're feeling that die off, you're moving in the right direction you know, typically. And we now have other tools too, besides tapering up and going slower. One of the things we recommend is using the mega IgG yeah. for people that yeah. really helps kind of quench some of that yeah. die off type of response. Um, people can, you know, um, use things like lactoferrin if they wish, if it helps them. Um, but we, we also encourage them to use the mega omega because the mega omega with the high EPA in there helps modulate inflammatory yeah. responses. Right. So there's a few things you can do to try to, to quell it, but yeah. it's a good sign. You need that change. And that's the thing I wanted right? you to reinforce with my audience the most is that it is okay. The increased mm -hmm. bloating, the increased, you know, the, the a little bit of cramping, the increased body ache and nausea or headache or fatigue mm -hmm. or whatever. These are good signs. These are, totally. these are pathogens dying, releasing toxins. You know, you're going to get through it. Just go slowly, drink a lot of water, you know, yeah. um, make sure your bowels are moving. Of course, totally. which Megaspore often does on in, in by itself, you know, yeah. but yeah, thank you for reinforcing that. I yeah, won't keep you important. too much longer, but um, I, I know you're, a busy man, but just a, a few more questions if I can pick your brain. For yeah, more things. Please. There's been a lot of success with Crohn's and colitis um, with a vegan diet. You know, mm -hmm. I've put a lot of my, um, my patients on it. I myself, along with soil-based organisms, as soon as I, I started eating a vegan diet, which I, mind you, I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a Southern family you know, yeah. we lived on meat, you know, and, you know, go back to Jordan Rubin and it's all mm -hmm. about, you know, more of a, a paleo based diet with, you know, yeah. high protein. Um, but you know, they, um, th the research shows that hydrogen sulfide is a huge issue with yeah. specifically with Crohn's and colitis patients. And of course, meat is very high in that you take the meat out and it seems to, I mean, the, the, they make strides so quickly compared mm -hmm. with the soil based organisms, you know, it helped me tremendously. Having said that, I never wanted to be vegan. I never wanted right. to remain vegan. It wasn't um, a goal of mine, but it almost became a necessity at one point. And so, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And then also, have you witnessed, you know, I mean, I have my own, you know, experience, but have you witnessed megaspore and soil, soil based organisms in general? Um, being able to almost remedy that and mm -hmm. kind of hack this issue of, you know, needing to just eliminate protein altogether because, you know, yeah. I will initially to get somebody out of a flare, you know, someone's very sick, whatever is with Crohn's or colitis, get them off of the meat and all the, you know, sulfide producing, yep. you know, ingredients or compounds. And, um, you know, it, it I mean, the difference is night and day, right? Yep. Yep. And um, un unbelievable, really. But, you know, for these people that don't necessarily just want to live on mm -hmm. vegetables the rest of your life, and I mean, not to mention my experience was when I, um, you know, I, I had this long break between primal defense and, and microbiome loves without soil-based organisms, really. And I went vegan to stay well, just to be a ground zero. I was so dry, my hair changed, mm -hmm. my, you know, just everything changed. I wasn't getting enough oils. I wasn't getting any protein. I was, I was lethargic and mm -hmm. there was just issues. And when I started incorporating some meats, I, I, I found myself feeling better, but then the whole hydrogen sulfide became, so how, how do soil-based organisms kind of hack that and play a role in reducing that? Yeah, that's that's a really important point because like in my view, health is based on resilience, right? Like if you if you say I feel perfectly fine as long as I don't eat this, 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 and this, to me that's not necessarily health, right? Because what as humans we need to be resilient. We have yeah. to have we have to be able to eat different things and 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 also it's a quality of life thing, sure. right? So um it, it becomes important. So I, I think you're you're absolutely right in that. Um, being able to hack that is, is a huge advantage. Now, 
part of the reason I think the plant-based foods really help people with Crohn's and colitis is because those plant-based foods feed the butyrate producing bacteria in sure. the large yeah. bowel, right? And yeah. elevated butyrate production is really good healing for the, for the large bowel, uh, especially when there's inflammation and damage there. So that really helps. Yeah. Um, however, and then, and you're right on that, the um, sulfate reducing bacteria love the meat-based products, eggs, shrimp, you know, red meat, and then they convert it to hydrogen sulfide, which causes more inflammation. Yeah, also, yeah. those tend to have higher fat, which means more bile is released. And then um, a lot of times people who have gut issues will have more microbes that convert bile to secondary bile salts, which can also be very inflammatory in the gut. Mm. So, and then the third part of it is digesting protein will release ammonia in a lot of people. And that ammonia can be very toxinic yeah. and inflammatory to the gut too, right? So so those are the three big areas and issues with the meat and the fat yeah. uh, in people with, with Crohn's t- right. colitis type of symptoms. Now, um, that can be undone because like, for example, we've done studies showing that, um, you know, people, and this is in liver failure patients who are really sensitive to elevations in ammonia and protein intake. Some of these patients, they can't take more than three or four grams of protein a day, or they could die right? Wow. Like die like this immediately, right? Because what happens is they're in liver failure, which means that any amount of ammonia that's produced in their bowel from digesting protein cannot get cleared from their liver, which means that it all ends up in their blood and they get a condition called um, encephalitis. So they, yeah. they will, uh, their brains will swell and then they die pretty quickly, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, we did a study in those kind of patients. They're called hepatic encephalopathy yeah. patients. And what we showed was that the spore-based probiotics were, were able to reduce ammonia production from protein digestion um, in these, even in these severely sensitive patients by almost 40%, right? So, so it helps alleviate that ammonia issue from yeah. digesting protein. Right. So it can really help you hack mm-hmm. that inability to consume protein. Yeah. The second part of it is the high, the sulfite reducing bacteria and the bacteria that convert bile into secondary bile salts. One of the great things about the spores is they're, they are also bile tolerant. Mm-hmm. So they can compete with the bile tolerant bacteria that convert bile to secondary bile salts. That's them going in and fighting those microbes. And they will also help compete with and bring down the growth of the overrepresentation of sulfate reducing bacteria okay. as well. Okay. So you absolutely can. And, yeah. and I encourage people to, um, you know, try to try to bring more diversity back into their diet, you know, unless there's, you know, there's moral or other issues for being yeah. vegan or whatever, that's yeah. their own choices. Of course. Of course. Yeah, you know, but but if if you're doing it purely out of necessity and you're trying to bring back a little bit of more resilience to your system to be able to enjoy more variety of foods, you can absolutely do that with the spores. And we've we've had lots of success in people doing that. Great information. Do you ever find, a, a, is there a time and a place for, um, you know, box bile and bile acids then touching on what you just said? Mm-hmm. Um, ox bile. Yeah. So um, it, it depends on whether or not it's someone that, like if somebody has a real issue with malabsorption of fat, like when they consume fat, they get really bad die off, uh, runoff, uh, sorry, diarrhea, not runoff. Yeah. Uh, they get bad, really bad diarrhea. So they know they're in tune with the fact that they don't digest fat well. Yeah. Yeah. And those people really do need some additional ox bile. Um, what that means is that their liver is not producing enough bile and bile acids. Right. Their bile acid pool is shrinking over time. Mm-hmm. The, the secondary effect of that is that you start to get an overgrowth of opportunistic and pathogenic organisms in your small bowel. Because one of the functions of bile is to act as an antimicrobial in the small bowel to control the growth of pathogens. And so if your bile acid pool is shrinking and you're not releasing enough bile, then it gives the opportunity for pathogens to actually start to overgrow in your gut um, and in your small bowel, in your small bowel, which can lead to all kinds of other problems. So, uh, in fact, it can increase your risk for diabetes and so on. So, like Klebsiella, that's mm-hmm. a great example of a microbe that becomes opportunistic and starts to grow when you don't have adequate bile going through, right? Because bile will prevent Klebsiella overgrowth. And so, and, and if you're on predominantly plant-based and you're not releasing much bile at all. So in those cases, uh, some supplemental ox bile could be really, really okay. beneficial. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. 
so much amazing information. In summary, you know, you're you're creating such a legacy with microbiome labs. I mean, I hope you know that. I think you know that. Um, and with Megaspore, you know, specifically, and um, you know, like I said, I receive emails on a daily basis of people just suffering so much, and um, you know, to the point where I I just I light a candle every night for though I just know what that feels like personally. Mm -hmm. And um, you've witnessed so much mm. with soil-based organisms and the transformation, you know, in, in health and gut health specifically, but health in general. And I can't even I imagine, you know, within your position, how much success you've, you've witnessed, which must just be, you know, beyond rewarding. I, you know, there's probably no words, um, but, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that are going to see this video and that reach out to me and they're so new to all this and they're, and maybe they just got diagnosed with IBS or some random gut infection, candida, SIBO, who knows, and um, their mental health is, they're just struggling. And I do my best, you know, on my, on my website, my channel, my everything to just provide first and foremost um, well, education, probably first and foremost, right? Um, but also just inspiration. Yeah. And so just uh, on, a, on a very human level, like yeah. what, what do you have? Can you, can you just give a token of with your expertise, you know, on a more personal, maybe emotional level than your, um, your scientific, you know? Yeah. Level? Can you share maybe just in summary your experiences and that and and give just a little hope for these people that have you know they feel like they've tried everything and they're not yeah. familiar with soil based organisms or mega igg and you know all these the total gut restoration kit all these things they don't understand you know all the, all these puzzle pieces that go together and they've just been giving this slap to this diagnosis what is your token of inspiration for these people yeah, and you know, I, I think um, a really important part of this is what we're seeing every day, like you said, right? So we, we see that at a large scale, we now have globally, I think probably 27, 28,000 doctors and health practitioners that use our products regularly every month. I'm in, oh, a, right. in a very fortunate position where I get yeah. to hear from a lot of them and I get to hear from people directly as well. And in fact, we send out these messages to the company. You know, we've got 110, 115 very hardworking people that make it all happen every day. And, and we send out the message with the title, here's why we do what we do, yeah. right? And it's just a message from somebody whose life, whose life has been completely changed. And, and so we know besides all the clinical research, uh, we know it works. So on top of all of the clinical science that validates the functionality, it's the real world stuff where the rubber hits the road, right? Mm -hmm. The messages from people that are the most meaningful, that are the most, to me, the most profound proof that, that all of this can be better, all of this can change. And my biggest message to people is we live in a very exciting time mm -hmm. because we're finally starting to understand what it means to be human, right? Mm -hmm. Up to this point, up to the last seven years, all of the research and clinical studies and all of that stuff has really only been looking at about 10% of who we are. Until we started looking at the microbiome, we, we did not unveil the other 90% of what makes us human. Wow. Right? And disease, almost every chronic illness can be traced back to some dysfunction in our ecosystem, mm. right? It's not bad luck. It's not our genetics. It's not any of those things, right? And and it's not your fifth chakra out of alignment. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, it's not those things. Yeah. It is an ecological system. It's yeah. your garden on the inside being off because the world around you is not in, in designed to be supportive of your system, yeah. right? And, and lots of it is outside of your control, right? You are inadvertently exposed to things like Roundup and uh, herbicides and pesticides. And 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 exactly, all of these things. Carpet, all those yep. things. Yeah. All these things that work against your system. But here's the best part about it is it's never too late to make a change. Yeah. And you have so much more control than you think, mm -hmm. right? You have so much more power in your own ability and choices that you make to effectuate change in your system that can be profound, 
right? You don't need to just rely on your doctors. You don't need to just rely on the medical staff of the hospital that it wrote down your diagnose, uh, diagnosis and labeled you with this problem, right? You have so much more that you can do to effectuate change and you can change. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. The body is designed to heal. The microbes sure. are trying to get back to the healthy state all the time. And there's so many things you can do to make that happen. And we've seen change occurring in people that were basically labeled with dealing with their problem for the rest of their lives, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and then you see these profound changes. And you, um, Karen, you're living proof of that, right? I mean, I think that's, that's uh, a, an amazing example of people who may have made that change, who've gone through that journey, the hardest part of the journey, because when you were going through it, you didn't have you as a, someone to, to follow <laughs> and learn from. I really it. didn't. I, Jordan did. Rubin was my, that was it at mm -hmm. that time, you know? Totally. And so I just, it, it's such a, it, it's really, truly a blessing when yeah. the microbiome labs came along. I just, I knew instantly that, that, that there was just a new trajectory yeah. You know, in the world of gut health. So, you know, just again and again and again, thank you. you know? Yeah. And when, I mean, you're taking your entire journey, all of the pains, all of the suffering that you went through, and then all of the learnings that you got out of it, all the education and the, and the acknowledgements and realizations, and then you're, you're bottling it up together to be able to provide it as a solution to people. Mm -hmm. And that's incredibly powerful because all of the work we do as a company would be absolutely meaningless if we didn't have people like you mm. to get it to people, right? Mm. Um, I'm not brave enough or smart enough to work with patients. <laughs> and so I need people like you to be able to take what we do and make it, um, you know, make it real for people, right? And get it to people. Mm. So, so thank you so much for this, for this partnership where we're so grateful um, to be able to get what we do out to people. And, and again, for people there's so much hope, you know, it's never so too much to change, right? So Your system much. may be broken. You may have gone through the rigmarole for the last 20 years. You can still make progress. You can still feel better. You can still live a better life. Don't feel like you're, you're, you're succumbed to one path yeah. only, right? And it may the, take time. It may be piece by totally. step by step, but, but it's a journey. It's a journey. And I think education is so key mm -hmm. in it for really understanding, getting away from all the traditional, the, you know, conventional diagnoses, probiotics, and, you know, and um, really understanding what soil-based probiotics do, you know, soil-based totally. organisms do. Totally. Yeah. And working with people like yourself, you know, you're, you're really their Sherpa through this. <laughs> Through this arduous journey up the mountain of health, right? It's a yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's some epidemics, right? I mean, these are mm -hmm. just epidemics of disastrous, you know, insane proportions of these yeah. of these conditions, and so, yeah, yeah. I can't wait. To, I can't wait to see, you know, in another five or ten years, the impact that your company and these products have in the world, I know that it's just going to be just monumental, you know, life. Thank you. Yeah, we, everything. We have so many studies going on right now. We have, um, uh, our pipeline is full of amazing technologies that are coming out. So uh, I'd love to come back on and, um, and do this with you again and talk about some of those, you know, That's and after right. all these years, I think this is the first time we've, we've This is the first time we've connected. I know, yeah. I've just always, always wanted to, you know, obviously, you know, make your acquaintance and say thank you for Italy and all those sure. things and and uh, and be able to pick your brain for my audience and I know that they're gonna just appreciate it so much just you know that being reinforced by you right. as you know, with someone with your you know credentials and your experiences can sometimes make the difference in them trusting and understanding yeah the products and taking that chance and staying committed uh, even through the die-off and the Herxheimer reactions and all that. I think your presence can make all the difference. So the interviews and the podcasts that you do are, you know, everything. Well, thank you so much. And I'm, I'm happy to come back whenever you need me. We so. would, I would love that. I'd Over love here. that. Yeah. I'll we'll do a part two and three and four and just keep going. That sounds great because I, I hear that there's, there's more, I hear that there's more product on the horizon. Yes. So, um, there's um, some really critical things coming out to deal with the gut brain axis, with mood and sleep, 
and some amazing strains. We have strains coming out that bind heavy metals for you in your gut. Wow. You know, so a specific probiotic bacteria that grabs onto lead and arsenic and cadmium in your gut that's coming in through food and water and all that and takes it out of the system. Uh, I mean, this, it's mind boggling the things we have in our So excited. So excited. So we will just absolutely look forward to touching base with you again, hopefully in the in the near future. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank I you. really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, 